Okay, we are recording. Welcome. This is the Tampa Bay IIBA Florida Chapter Study Group for August 2022. Today is our 48th consecutive study group class. Wow. Uh, we have a worldwide audience, uh, but we are based out of Tampa Bay, uh, the Tampa Bay area, which means that we basically are responsible for the northern half of Florida and we have people participating in our study group and our chapter from all over the world. Our mission here is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the BA community. As you know, uh, we have a variety of ways you can reach us. We have our study group, which is what we're recording now, every Tuesday night between 7 and 8 Eastern. We have a meetup that has all of our events, which includes uh, lunch and learns, this study group, and we have a park that we've adopted in Tampa that we get together periodically and do clean up. Uh, or we have some dinners that we have periodically. COVID has shut us down for a lot of those things, but we're trying to get some of those back up. If you're interested in past meeting recordings, this highlighted in turquoise is the, the link for that. Uh, if you need any of these sent to you directly, if you want to just let me know by LinkedIn, I'll be glad to send you this copy of all of this. We have an IBA website. Uh, we have the, our meetup again and uh, Facebook. We also have two LinkedIn groups. So you have a, a lot of different ways you can reach us. Uh, as I said, this is our 48th study group. Here's some samples of things that we've done in the past. We went through sample test questions uh, two chapters, I'm sorry, one chapter for every two weeks, and we uh, were able to cover all of the chapters in the BABOC, including all the techniques. Uh, right now, we're going through our professional series. We've had Damon, who is our developer. Bob Churchill brought us simulations. Uh, Keith Nolan brought us business architecture. And tonight, my special guest, a good friend of mine, is Tammy Bearden. She's a knowledge manager. Some of y'all don't know that knowledge management is a profession, just like some people don't know business analysis is a profession. Uh, Yulia, you have your hand up? Oh, okay. No, it's I'm clapping. Oh, you're clapping. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Sorry, I, I want to be responsive to hands up. Um, Tammy's going to give us a presentation today, and let me finish this, this real quick. I do still need a good project manager to give us a presentation and a good UI UX person to give us a presentation. My purpose in these presentations is not only so that we as a group will understand what that profession is responsible for, their role in the organization, the fact that they have different roles in different companies depending on what the company's needs are, but also how we as business analysts can best help them and how they, can, how they need information from us. Uh, in many of these professions, we're all partners. They do a different type of thing than we do, but we help each other. Uh, in our future classes, we're going to go back through this, the sample test questions. Some of the people that are attending now were not attending when we went through the first time. Some of you, like Yulia, man, you stuck with us forever and, and we really appreciate it. But honestly, it's the conversations that we have as we go through these test questions that we can say why this answer is wrong or why this answer is right. And some of them we just get to commiserate as to that's a horrible question. They shouldn't have worded it that way. But now we know how they want us to answer it so we can be successful on the test. Um, our organization, as I said, is run by volunteers. Cliff is our president. He is on vacation. He said his wife forbade him to bring his computer with him. Uh, Lori is our vice president of finance. Caitlin and Priscilla are board members at large. My name is Thea Raisins. I'm the vice president of career and professional development for our chapter. And I've held this role for 10 years in this chapter or other chapters, as well as being chapter president, organizer, founder, et cetera. Uh, we need more chapter members. We need, I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing there. We need more uh, board members. So if you're interested in being a board member, please reach out to me via LinkedIn so that we can see about putting you uh, on our board. This doesn't mean that you have to have a heavy commitment. We need a member that can uh, take the place of our board members at large so that you just lean in and say, hey, I've got some bandwidth. 
or we call you and say, hey, you know something about finance, can you help us answer this question? So we are working on getting our, our chapter uh, to be a not-for-profit, getting all that certification done so that we can get that cleared out and just move forward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you Tammy's LinkedIn profile here. This is Tammy Bearden. She is the research manager discovering key insights to help our clients succeed. I want you to know Tammy also on a very, very consistent basis puts information out on LinkedIn about good things or things that she is involved in. I'm sorry, good things she's involved in or other good things, but they're always informative, interesting, and just wonderful to uh, listen to and watch and read. So I would encourage you to keep an eye on her. She's going to be a mover and a shaker forever because I know her. And I'm going to turn it over now to Tammy. Tammy, tell us what a research manager does. Thanks. Can you hear me? I think I'm back still. On. Good. Um, I also, um, yes. So <laughs> research manager, uh, my role has historically been for about 25 years or so, um, uncovering data, insights, research um, from different angles. So depending on what the problem statement or the issue is, um, nailing down what the problem or opportunity is, is the number one thing. Because you can answer lots of questions with lots of great answers, but if you don't get the question right, it doesn't matter how much data, how much information, how much research you do. If you're going down the wrong path, you're just not gonna get the right result. So uh, as a research manager, that's my, I would say that's one of my biggest goals is uh, do, we, do we have the problem statement defined well? And so a lot of elicitation happens with that. So um, that is the first thing. I am trying to get shared screen. You cannot share screen while other participant is sharing. Oh, would you like me to share my screen? Okay, and you're on mute, so I think you just gave it to me. I just clicked share. There you go. Share screen. Okay, desktop. I'm gonna try this. Desktop one. I don't think that's and gonna be it. While you're getting it set up, let me mention that Bob Churchill is our CBAP oh. in residence, and he is online with us, making this a legit oh, study group. <laughs> go ahead, Tammy. I am trying to get it to share my screen. So I've got. Um, okay, I'm not sharing any longer. I know. And it's my my menu options. Sorry, guys, I'm not. I'm not as familiar. Desktop share. Open system preferences. I have no idea why it's not doing this for you. Let's try this. You have to allow share screen. Is it allowed? Yeah, um, because I'm on a Mac, it's got different security provisions. Oh, um, I what um, if I send you my deck, Bia, will you post it? it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. In fact, I can share it while you. That's what, yeah, that's what I was wanting to do. So, um, if, if you have any other business to conduct, do that right right now while I get this sent to you. Because I was hoping to drive it, but clearly that's not going to work for me. Okay, well, let's go without trying to ask Tammy too many questions. Let me share my screen. <laughs> da, da, da. And let's talk about Tammy's LinkedIn profile because we've talked about what makes a good LinkedIn profile. And Tammy is one I always go to. First of all, I've told you, if you have a picture of yourself, it always gets more attention. It makes you a real person. Uh, of course, she's got a byline here that talks about her goal and who she is. Um, let's see. She's got her about section filled out. Sorry, I'm having trouble scrolling down here. There we go. Her about section is considerably longer than mine is and so i want you to just take a gander at what she has she talks about who she is where she works what her goals are and her experience what she does outside of work and here is her information about strength finder myers-briggs 
as far as I'm concerned, this information, if you understand it, tells who somebody is as much as their name, their certifications, their email address. Um, so I see that she's in the Enneagram. Uh-huh. Are you using that for business practices? Uh, not as much for business practices as it is about better understanding the human dynamics of people in groups. Mm -hmm. So the more you understand about it, the more you can kind of discern why is, what is the internal motivation that, um, that might explain why that person is behavior is different than maybe what I thought it should be. Um, yeah. And I know what it is. I just wondered if you were using yeah. it. Not for plus. business. No, I mean, we have some groups where we've talked about it uh, in yeah. a business sense, but no. We do have a gentleman who's recently joined our group um, who is my, uh, who came from the Myers-Briggs organization. He will be using some of that typing for change management. So, okay. Tammy, uh, what email did you send it to? I sent it through your LinkedIn. Oh, through LinkedIn. Well, yeah, because you, you have several different emails, sorry. It's okay. I'm happy to go to LinkedIn. I just wanted to be looking for it in the right place. Yeah. The reason I have um, the Sparkotype, the Enneagram, the Myers-Briggs, the Gallup strings on there is because I want people to know who they're working with. As an Enneagram 7, for those of you who do know what an Enneagram 7 is, they're very spontaneous, can be seen as very flighty. It's because they love a lot of action, action, a lot of diverse type of work, and um, are interested in far too many things. <laughs> so... Um, but I, I think with any, anytime you're going to write a bio, um, if you're, if you're comfortable putting out what, who it is you are, it's helpful. I think for the, especially if you're doing consulting services, right? Cause people want to know who they're working with. Um, so that's why that bio has got a lot of those in there. Uh, unless you have this in your presentation, tell us about the place you work. Um, is, is it displayed yet? Uh, well, I'm working on getting okay. to the link. Yeah. So, so 18, just... yeah, 1898 and co is a management consult. I'm in the management consulting group in 1898. We are a business technology and cybersecurity consultancy. So we uh, advise our clients, mostly utilities, but a lot of other critical infrastructure of America businesses, um, how to optimize their spending, what technology platforms can help them uh, they can use to make decisions. Uh, we do strategic road mapping to help them think through, um, you know, what is the first, first, the next best step, and then the next, and then the next. And, and from that, they can often come up with ways then they need to fund projects, um, how to build, re, rebuild or, or new builds for their infrastructure to support the in this case, electric loads that they need to deliver. But um, we also have, do some software development. So software as a service licensed model and um, cybersecurity. So for those of you who are transitioning between different jobs and roles, cybersecurity is a big deal. I mean, every, there's so many threat actors out there trying to get to our data and critical infrastructure of America airports, roads, bridges, water, electricity, those are big targets. So cybersecurity professionals are in high demand right now. So we hire them and, and they go out to oil rigs and check for, you know, cybersecurity protocols, make sure that things are happening the way they're supposed to. So uh, it's very, we have a, a diverse set of uh, employees. I, I say 1898 has the most diverse of all of the engineering work as an engineering organization, we have analysts and software developers and um, business analysts also, uh, but, but lots of other analysts too that have engineering degrees. We have people from econ as a study. Uh, we have industrial engineering, which kind of, you talk about UX, UI, that's the kind of people who really care about making sure user experience is good, so. Uh, tell us the name of the organization that your company came from. Oh, 1898 and Co. is the is a brand or uh, part of uh, Burns and McDonald. Burns and McDonald is a 125 year old, almost 125 years, uh, engineering consulting firm. So we did some of our first projects were in water in the middle of Kansas. So municipal water systems is is one of the early ones we. So most cut our teeth on. Most people here, if you know Kansas City at all, you know Burns and McDonald. 
even if you don't know 1898. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm trying to open it, I promise. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, you can see through that LinkedIn profile um, a little bit more about our business, but we uh, have really benefited from um, working directly with the engineers throughout all the different lines of business that uh, the company serves. And then also uh, extending that beyond to really thinking through problems from a different angle. That's why the diversity of personality or backgrounds is really important to us. It's important to have people with different perspectives and experience so that you can see things from different perspectives. Oh yeah. So okay. we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's about inclusion of, of perspectives, backgrounds, experiences, um, not just what we look like, but that's also very important. And I want to note that whenever you talk about diversity and you're talking about getting new ex different experiences, having a new person come in with absolutely no preconceived ideas or experience mm -hmm. is sometimes so valuable to the people because they kind of go, wait, you're talking about this thing and I don't know what you're talking because you're speaking the acronyms and your mm -hmm. own cultural speak. That you need that new person to come in, especially whenever you're creating training for new people, you need a new person to have that perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tammy, I can see your presentation now. I think you all can see it. If you want to tell me. I can't see it. Can you all see it? Yeah, okay. you can yep. see it. View. Side by side. Gallery. No. Full screen. I see you guys at full screen. Um, well, they can see your, your presentation. So pull up your presentation on your screen. I'm going to walk through it with you. So um, I, I really just wanted to anchor this. Um, so what is knowledge management and why is it important? Um, you guys already know on slide two who I am. Um, but I also am curious uh, what do you want to understand better from this session? So slide three, if you're, if you're clicking through. Um, and uh, where your where your backgrounds are. So are you working for organizations now? Are you all in the study group because you're seeking different types of jobs in the future? What's your what's your backgrounds? So you can just unmic or that's chat. A great, that's a great question. I'll start. So uh, my name is Ben Hur. Uh -huh. So I my I'm a recent graduate from Durham Mason University. I'm currently I see I'm gonna be starting my job next week. I'm doing I'm gonna be doing help desk work, but I see myself on a long run as a BA, a business analyst profession I enjoy. Yeah. So um I see what I seek to understand from this session is I wanna I wanna increase my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I wanna see, you know, I wanna know, especially you know, the best way to learn is professional that are already in the field. I think that's the best mm -hmm. way to learn to have experience, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and I wanna see, you know, why you know if this is a and actually I already made this just an ideal fit. I just wanna see where uh, where i can go so that's mm -hmm. my that's my uh, okay that's my that's what I'm, thank you great uh yulia will you tell us about you for a second yeah i was planning to go the last because i always talk a lot <laughs> it's my course and a blessing at the same time um right now currently i'm a full-time student pursuing my master's in finance uh, with quantitative analysis track, which is going to be STEM degree. Um, I'm having my summer internship at Amgen, which is a biotechnology company. Yes. Really enjoying it. Mm -hmm. And currently I'm preparing for my CBAP certification. I cleared all steps. So now I need to be ready for exam and just uh, schedule exam and pass it. So I'm planning to do it in September. And why I'm here, uh, I joined a year ago, so to know, to get to know the people, to get to know about IBA, Babook, right? Because I remember when I picked it first time, I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> first time I looked at it. So now it's kind of growth on me. Um, and yeah, I will continue joining uh, when I even I pass it up, uh, just to keep in touch with people and learning new things. Great. Who would like to go next? Sylvia, I'm at a TD Cynics contracted there. I saw that the 
your company does trend micro. So I do a lot of the back end data. They they just merged. So I'm working on some of the Canada data systems right now. They're transitioning everything into different things. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Merge, I don't know. Mergers I are I, mergers are hard. There's a lot going on. Yes. <laughs> so I have a background in uh, coding and data and development. So um, it's what I'm doing now is accounting, which mm -hmm. I've never really done before, but it's data. So I can do that. But yeah. yeah, it's funny how the skills transfer to so many different things. Yeah, I wasn't going to touch on that in this presentation because we don't have enough time. But yeah, I 100% agree if you've been in four different industries and knowledge management and research has extended across them all which I can have done presentations on that too. Happy to talk about that, about skill transference at some other time. Yeah, I've done Thank knowledge you, management with service oh. now for yes. uh, Best Buy's globally way back. Mm. But um, I sent you an invite on LinkedIn. So Good. You can talk Thank you. again. Okay. All right, thanks. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? Um, good evening. Oh, yeah. I would like to introduce myself. Okay, so my name is Ramat. I'm from Toronto, Canada. And um, I just joined recently, like today, actually. So um, I work with Service Canada as an information officer. Um, I just finished um, doing like a training in BA and I like it's, it's like a six weeks class but I'm still new. I do not have that deep knowledge. So I'm here to um, get some more knowledge and um, understand what the BA um, it entails exactly and probably um, sit for the, the CBAB exam. Okay. Anyone else? Danielle, you wanted to go? Well, I'll go ahead. Real quick, I won't take too much time. Um, let me turn up my volume. Uh, name is Shonda Moore. I am in a, the process of transitioning. So I've been in a lot of different areas. Um, my business degree, I have business administration degree. I have an MBA, but I was also a counselor. So a career coach for um, six or seven years. I worked in K through 12. I worked with high school students, college students, and my last stop was with military spouses. So I transitioned out of that into talent acquisition. I'm currently a contractor with PwC working in people operations, but um, just going back to my business roots, uh, I think my counseling degree would still be helpful, but um, want to learn more about the business analysis role. I have been the last year and a half kind of um, preparing for the Salesforce certification as well. So I think this will be helpful um, in that in that whole route. But that's the route I'm going right now. So I'm working in talent acquisitions, but I'm trying to transition out of that into BA. Very nice. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Tammy, that's not everyone, but as you can see, we have hey. people who are new out of school and people who are deep into their career with deep history and good experience. Talk about a diverse group. This is exactly why you mix minds together and you meld a little bit and you learn from each other. We have uh, reverse mentoring back when we were at Hallmark and I were, we had reverse mentors. Um, I do a mentoring circle also. We just met um, over lunch today, different age groups, different backgrounds. It's been fantastic, but yeah, we can all learn from each other. So um, if you will go to slide three, actually, which one are you on? Pembuck six? Uh, we are going to slide three. Pembuck six. Yeah. So um, I don't know how many of you have also studied the uh, anything from PMI or are looking at getting a PEM, uh, okay, cool. So Bob has, um, so PMBOK up until the sixth edition didn't even have knowledge management it, as, a, as a process stream. Uh, it wasn't until, uh, it was what, five, six years ago that the PMBOK 6 um, uh, came out and 
uh, that they finally had a process for um, knowledge management. Lessons learned and capturing them in the, in the flow of, oh wait, show that again, Bob. Do, do us all a favor and, yep, that's the six. I have the five on my shelf. Is that the six? Okay, yep. So the five did not yet have um, knowledge management in there, but they, as of the sixth version, they added it as a, as a process because it is critically important to capture the knowledge in the flow of projects for sure um, as you're doing work on the project. So uh, a lot of times people are like, oh yeah, I'll remember that later. You don't, okay? You don't. <laughs> how, you code your, how you code your files, how you store your files, all of that helps you then re, um, go back and reuse the knowledge that you've gained. And so um, I was so thankful to see that they had included process um, of using existing knowledge, but if you don't, if you don't capture the product, capture the knowledge first, you can't reuse it. So it, its purpose is to really inform current projects, um, inform future projects, as well as your current projects during, during different, like if you use an agile, you know, just kind of going back through and knowledge transfer as you bring more people in onto projects or programs or whatever you're working on. Um, not everybody started at the same time on that project program or initiative, you, you need to get them up to speed. So without a lot of knowledge capture, um, and knowledge management, codifying your internal critical information on that project program initiative or the company at large, um, you're going to struggle with onboarding other people onto a project. So um, Pembox specifically said, you know, this is how they've defined their new process. Uh, as we know, with any standard amazing um, guidebook, we, we try to use as much of it as possible in some situations and settings. You can't use the whole thing in context the whole time, every time, because different cultures tolerate different levels of um, process and rigor and discipline. So um, it is essential, in my opinion, for us to continue, continually capture more and more of our intellectual capital inside of an organization for the purposes of future reuse. So if you flip to what is knowledge management, um, really, um, this is not a new concept at all. Um, since the dawn of time, people have been, you know, sharing stories, tribal knowledge, uh, et cetera. But in 1994, Tom Davenport finally defined KM as the process of capturing, distributing, and effectively using knowledge. He and, is it Tom Davenport and Prusak wrote um, some books, which I also have on my shelf. Gary Prusak, um, I don't see that one. Um, to start to put this into practice. And um, they had predecessors as well. They were the ones that popularized it in the press, uh, but uh, it actually, um, I cannot think of the original gentleman who, who coined the phrase, but it didn't get popular until the nineties. So um, it's really, you know, you can read through these. I'm not gonna read them to you, but um, the one thing that is so similar about knowledge management, project management, but business analysis and anything else that has change management in the back of it is a discipline and it takes deliberate action. And it does not, it is not something that you're like, oh, I'm going to get paid extra because I did this. Um, sometimes it's not even in the flow of a project, billable cycle of a project. Sometimes um, it's, it's acknowledging that the secondary beneficiaries will gain a lot of value. So it's the long view, really. Um, it's kind of the infinite game. So um, just like with change management, just like business analysis, it takes a lot of discipline to do this, to do it well and to stay the course because sometimes it's not appreciated until it's needed. So uh, knowledge types. So if you flip to that next one, there is obviously um, knowledge exists in our heads, it exists in books, it exists in systems, it exists all around us, um, but there are different types of knowledge. So the explicit knowledge is that stuff that I just mentioned that's documented and codified like in books, in my notebooks, in my bookshelf, in physical libraries, in digital libraries. Um, it's, it's more concrete. You can either touch it, describe it, point to it, whatever. Tacit knowledge, however, is <laughs> it's, it's these, these amazing nuggets that float through our head all the time, right? Like they're, sometimes you can describe them, sometimes you can't. Sometimes there's multiple senses that come into play when you're talking about the knowledge that goes along with like 
when the screen door, when I hear that screen door slam, I picture myself right back at my grandma's house because that sound triggers some knowledge memory in my head. So tacit knowledge um, is uh, what kind of goes inside of, it's kind of what's inside of our head. It's harder to get out. So we talk about in um, business analysis, elicitation, that is really important for business analysis, for research, for knowledge management, because so much of what we know, we don't even know we know it until we speak it or until someone asks us and then we find it somewhere in the back of our, cat, our card catalog. Um, and so whether we're talking about projects or organizations, both the explicit documented knowledge as well as the knowledge inside of your subject matter experts' heads are really, really important. Um, in order to often get that explicit knowledge out, that tacit, or sorry, to get the explicit knowledge codified, you gotta tap into the tacit knowledge of the subject matter experts, which I get to do every Friday on a podcast internally, which is so much fun. So if you know a subject matter expert in your lane, um, ask them if they wanna do a podcast every week. They will be flattered by your um, offer and you will learn so much. Uh, next slide. What is on that one? Oh, okay. So yeah. So we already talked about this, like databases and network drive, SharePoint, you know, all these places where you can codify information, physical libraries. If you're talking about like your university library or um, uh, physical library down the street, tacit knowledge really starts to um, get transferred between parties. It, when you're mentoring or job shadowing, we have um, working out loud is something we like to remind people to do as often as possible. We even made stickers. Not that working out loud is the term I coined. However, I was like, we got to put these stickers on these mugs that remind people like um, in an engineering firm, sometimes our engineers are a little quieter than someone who maybe is in a marketing agency that is a little more vibrancy, louder, boisterous um, teams. So working out loud is, is a way to transfer knowledge without, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. Um, storytelling, we have a creative designer on our team who loves storytelling. He likes to put words to pictures, sorry, yeah, words and data into pictures to tell stories, to help clients figure out, okay, where are we going with this? And what's the, that's, I got the what, the so what, and now what? And he does it through storytelling. Um, knowledge cafes, which uh, I think, Thea, did you do knowledge cafes for a while? Or was it coffee talks or something like that? We've done lean coffee. Lean coffee, that's what it is, yeah. Um, identifying what they want to hear about and then people vote and yeah. whatever they want to hear, whatever the most people want to hear about is what we talk about. Yeah, that's a great way to engage the audience. Um, and then other ways like communities of practice. So people will just go on and, and post things on discussion boards and things. And um, a, lot of, a lot of times it's in response to a question, comment or frustration, but there's tools like social media listening tools. And back when we were at Hallmark, um, we did have a social media team literally looking at listening to, there was algorithms um, triggering like what's going, what are people posting on Twitter about, um, about the products that Hallmark was selling. So you can do that inside the enterprise as well. Uh, I'm going to go to seven or common problem statements. <laughs> These are not new concepts. You guys will probably all, some of this will resonate with all of you. I read those from my two folks. Does any of, do, do any of those resonate with anyone? Hand up or example you could suggest? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Yulia, any of those, which one of those resonates especially well with you? Well, Sylvia. okay, the most recent example, my internship onboarding, and I'm working uh, in uh, a Fortune 500 companies, so mm -hmm. you can imagine how much resources they have, but they're still missing a lot of, of knowledge management, right, knowledge transfer. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are not documented, so I was working on several projects, uh, I'm a business analyst and there is no documentation whatsoever, mm -hmm. like zero. So I, I needed to create everything from scratch and they're very grateful for that. And, and you probably, it's, you had to create from scratch because somebody hadn't put it down onto, into a system, that, a system of record or done any retention of records that did exist. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that they're very thankful for that. Tejas, did I say your name right? I'm sorry. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, so uh, when, when you say KM or knowledge management, um, does that ideally mean that you, you're, you're like, like they're saying something, but your attention is not on what they're saying? Like, for example, you're in La La Land. And they're talking about you know, they're talking about um, you know requirements and, and and working with developers or testers or developers are saying you know something and and you're like oh you know are you completely in La La Land you're like uh, yeah yeah you know definitely and I definitely know what you're saying yeah um, I'm, I mean this is total La La Land stuff that you know that I'm and and so how do you try to try to escape something like that problem statement with 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 somebody you know who's not really paying attention you know they're they're you're like saying you know this that this this and they're like oh uh i'm not really this you know i'm you know i'm in uh, i'm in my own world you know when you want to come talk to me you can you know so so how do you try to try to try to uh elaborate on on something like that you know a problem statement like that um i think that's really attention management and i think that's gonna it, you, I don't think you do knowledge management very well until you do have the attention of those parties that are trying to transfer the knowledge from, from one to another, um, or you've got really good listening skills or good elicitation. So uh, when we talk about like, if, if you wanna say knowledge management and attention management together, um, coming up with the proper nomenclature that is understood by all. So I have a friend here at work who uses the phrase, don't use weasel words. Weasel words would be like the things that not everyone has a common understanding around. So if there's groups of people who are, one feels like they're you know in La La Land because they don't understand what is being spoken about, a lot of Q&A to say, like, when you say um, knowledge management, what do you mean by that? And then just normalizing that among the group. With knowledge management as an example, you'll get a lot of different points of view, just like with business analysis, just like with project management, it depends on the perspective of the person. It's not that it hasn't been written about, defined, and now in, um, oh, by the way, I think there's also two ISO, there's an ISO standard and an Israeli standard for knowledge management systems. And that's not just the technology platform. It means like a system of doing knowledge management. And I'll show you an organization in a second, APQC, who cares deeply about doing knowledge management right so much that they have created frameworks and um, maturity models around it. But thank you guys for the questions and comments. Uh, oh, but, but but when you say weasel words, when you say weasel words, does that really mean like, uh, like does that really mean like, uh, 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 like you're talking about knowledge management to me and, and I, I'm like, you know, I just want some ice cream. <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> what do you like they're talking about knowledge and stuff so so you know, i mean I'll, I'll read a book maybe tomorrow if you if you really want me to or something but it's it's very hard for me to it's very hard for me to uh, uh be uh, completely on knowledge man because i have no idea what you're saying yeah like, uh, it's well like, i won't you, give you a test so that's a good thing right we're not testing yeah. you today. Just, just sharing information. But yeah, so yeah, so if they're thinking about ice cream and stuff, which is okay, no, um, what are you supposed to do then? Well, I think that's a different. I think that's a totally different conversation than knowledge management because you're really talking there about attention management with the person, the, what matters the, to them, and and meeting them where they are to help them come along to where you're going. Like I have no idea what if if it's 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 something in the bad box may be great you know maybe you know like if it's something like knowledge actual knowledge management like what is it like are you saying that you're gonna I'm gonna learn something that is maybe like a professor can teach me you know something like that or you know what what type of knowledge are we talking about is yes. it auditory is it like visual? it's all yeah Thea do you have anything you want to share. You know, Tammy, you told me one time about a task that you were given that blew me away. You were told to find uh, households that lived within 50 miles of water, bodies of water in the state of Arizona that had, I mean, this, this conglomeration of these things that I don't have a clue where you would go to find all of this different information, but that was the task you were given. And I'm assuming they were looking for hydroponics or, I mean, hydro power or solar mm -hmm. or something, but they were looking for a specific group of people. And 
there's that kind of knowledge management that you have. But then there's, in addition to that, there is how to get the information the company needs and keep it in a format and availability For so you can actually access it. Yeah. So you've got, you've got both sides of that is for knowledge management. Oh, yeah. so, so, so is that, is that when you talk to a developer and the developer says like, okay, so what you're saying is, what you're saying is, is completely different language than what I expect it to be. Like, for example, like if you're talking to me in elements or arrays or object oriented programming, mm -hmm. then I'm going to listen to you. But I, as far as knowledge management goes, I'm I'm thinking books and stuff. So so like so like how to communicate that? Like how to be, how to be be literally be a liaison between between what they're saying, what what they're saying, and what you're what you're what you're what you're want want like you said, what the organization, what you want the organization to have in terms of requirements, in terms of elicitation techniques that that you're able to easily like flow communication back and forth. Like the stakeholders is just like. Oh, you stakeholders are like I mean, yeah, this is this is absolutely great. But are you telling? What are you telling me in in either in in either like uh uh in in either like a programming language or a test language or mm -hmm. or either or maybe being a business language? And so, is it going to profit the company overall to be able to to be able to um uh to be able to uh work well uh work well with work well with the overall uh, work well overall with the aspect of mm, of where where what adds value uh to the end client because that's you know that would that would that would probably be something that i'd be interested in and in learning about you know things mm -hmm. to think you guys uh why don't we talk about knowledge management in the in the new hire process tammy that's something that everybody can relate to regardless if they're in engineering or anything else yeah oh that's so yeah, so um, we just actually just redid our onboarding road mapping, um, which I don't have any slides for for that because I, I wasn't thinking that that would be something that would be um, a topic that I would cover today, but it absolutely is like you come into an organization and you don't know much right you know the name of the company you know they might take it to your desk you don't you don't understand the culture you don't know how to do timesheets and how that might differ like I heard some of you are from uh, engine um, e n g i e is that it and then some are at PwC and some are at other organizations. How you do your timesheets are different. So there's some onboarding training knowledge that has to occur. Then you're going to have these side conversations as you're walking to get coffee. You're going to learn something about someone or about an opportunity or business need. That's knowledge transfer as well. So um, APQC as an organization, they talk about uh, orchestrating serendipity. We Mentoring is another one. Um, by, by putting people who might have um, tangential thoughts together, you will often emerge something from, from that arrangement um, in your mentoring circles or in your mentoring relationship that um, happens. But onboarding is, a, a again, yes, every company, every organization has to go through that. It's getting to know your context, the language of the firm, the uh, acronyms, the needs, how the business is measuring success, um, and all of those pieces and parts go with onboarding. So yeah, a lot of knowledge transfer, a lot of things would be then in that case documented in codes or not codes, um, like I guess maybe a dress code or an employee handbook, but also all, all your online systems too for like, if you have an uh, internal social network, we use Yammer and Microsoft Teams, um, to do a lot of that conversation threading. So those, those are the places where knowledge gets transferred and you, often it's verbal, sometimes it's written. Um, and the other, th the other thing I say a lot is, and this is so, I, I experience it constantly, just because you disseminate information. So you post it on a website, you hand somebody a book, you speak it, doesn't mean that they consumed it. And it also doesn't mean that they understand it or that they agree with you. So the difference between delivering information and people consuming it and, and coming to an agreement with you is very different. Okay. So. Thank you, Tammy. I've moved on to slide number eight. Where you eight. Thank you. Yes. This is my favorite. Oh my gosh. APQC. Here we go. So APQC is a organization called um, American Productivity and Quality Center. They are fantastic when it comes to like process, 
um, technology, mostly process, but um, knowledge management as well, and a lot of quality metrics. So when we start talking about some of your questions to ask and others, there is a continuum of the types of knowledge transfer that occurs. Some, um, and the, the color coding is um, goes back to another example, which I don't have displayed here, but the um, organic things that happen, people walking down the hall, having conversations, spontaneous knowledge sharing, collaboration, which is in green, um, and then enterprise social networking, which is above. You might go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you also liked, well, first of all, I didn't know you had an FFA drone pilot license. By the way, we need to put you on this project because somebody in their enterprise social network inside the company might have been talking about flying their drone. So now that we're doing critical infrastructure America, we got poles and wires to, and bridges to inspect, we might need an FFA pilot. So what somebody put on an enterprise social network may not have been specifically about, I purposely want to share this information so I can work on a project, but serendipitously, someone else may have discovered it and said, that's really important information for how we're going to do project work later. So again, continuing from continuum from the organic to the systematic um, is the difference of having an impromptu conversation all the way to having highly codified procedures in more of a library setting. Bob, your bookshelf may not match that of like uh, a library with the Dewey Decimal System, but it's your organizing strategy, right? I'm assuming you know where everything is on that shelf. Same with me on my bookshelf, right? But um, there's systematic ways of capturing knowledge. Um, sometimes we host, you guys, Fia, maybe you've talked about retrospectives or after action reviews. Um, that's on here as well um, in the more of a teal or blue color after, and that's a systematic thing. You actually schedule time. You actually ask people what worked well, what didn't work well, what will we change? Um, and then you make decisions off of it and you capture that. But there's everything in between. You'll see lots of those. Um, I asked about, or I mentioned earlier about hosting a podcast. So every Friday I meet with a gentleman named Doug Hausman. He's a subject matter expert about the utility industry. He's also a futurist. So he really does think way down the path and very much a systems thinker. Um, so he challenges me and everyone else he talks to, to think bigger, broader, um, and more comprehensively about the work that we're doing, how it, who it affects, how it affects them. Um, if we're going to move to zero emissions, um, you know, energy footprint, uh, so no carbon, decarbonizing everything, what's that going to take? What's it going to cost? Who's it going to be affected? With? You know, who's going to be affected by it? So I talk with him every Friday because one, during COVID, he and all of us were stuck at home and he's a teacher and he liked to go to conferences. And I said, Hey, you want to do a podcast? He's like, yeah, sure. So next thing you know, we're talking about what's on his mind this week. And we are now at 93, 94 episodes of that. So it's super, super fun. But every time we get on there, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Like we're talking a couple of days in advance. We'll decide what the topic is, but then I'm like, Oh my gosh, he just exploded my brain again on a topic I didn't know anything about, but when you're curious enough to ask and you start to facilitate these conversations using the same skills that you use in BA, elicitation skills, um, uh, appreciative inquiry, hum some people call it humble inquiry, uh, you start to get a lot of information out. For me, with Doug, it's selfish. I want to learn from him. For my audience, I want them to be able to learn from him. And for our organization at large, I want his expertise to be captured. If he's not writing it in decks and documents, at least we have his voice captured through, and you know, he's been doing this for decades. So he's not gonna, he's not gonna stick around forever with our organization. So um, that is the continuum that I think is super, super fascinating that it doesn't, there's not one way to do knowledge management and you don't have to do all of these. I did map each one of these uh, items that are listed here to what are we doing internally to, to, to hit on some of these so we can capture, manage, and share more of what we know. This book, again, I, I held it up before, but you probably didn't see it. If we only knew what we know, 
I think Yulia actually mentioned that, you know, she had to document a lot of things that weren't documented. If we only knew what we know internally about what the collective wisdom is of the group, um, we'd be able to make decisions differently and smarter. Um, I think I just have one other slide that I really want to talk about, and that is uh, the, is there a market for knowledge management? So I know you guys are all studying for a BABOC. I'm not trying to convince you that uh, knowledge management is the way to go. I think there's a lot of similarities and interdependencies, um, but yes, there is a market for knowledge management. Uh, 11,883 results today in um, the United States in uh, LinkedIn for knowledge management as, jo as jobs. So uh, if you're more curious about it, can, you can read some of those job descriptions, get a little bit more perspective on it from that point. I think Paloma did that. She bumped into a job description, maybe asked Thea, like, what, is this, what does this mean? Like, does, these people really actually exist? Yes, they do. Um, and they're hiring like crazy because information is growing at such a rapid pace and getting our arms around it and harnessing it for the benefit of an organization or a project is very, very, very difficult especially if we're not disciplined about making it happen. So if you have additional questions about knowledge management, my information is on slide two. Okay, well, slide what number? I think it's, uh, it's the who am I with the word cloud. Ah. Sorry, I don't know what number it is on yours. It's showing us two on, um, it's the second slide on mine. Okay. That doesn't have contact information for you. Do you want them to contact? Oh, them? you're right. It doesn't. Well, my name's on there. So LinkedIn is perfect. You can LinkedIn just reach me. I'm on there every day. I have I have critical questions I want to ask. Okay. In my experience in knowledge management in corporations, typically it's not a single person's responsibility. And so people put in the different little tidbits that they think is important. There's not mm -hmm. consistency. Mm -hmm. Then they switch from Confluence to SharePoint. Then they switch from SharePoint to something else. And nobody ever says, oh, no, that's out of date. So people stumble on out of date information and it becomes a firestorm. Tell us what, what applications you suggest that we use for knowledge management and if there are specific ways of cataloging, cataloging or indexing by topics so people can find the information. 100%, yes. I actually cut my teeth on SharePoint when it was WSS. So I don't know what year that was, but it went from WSS to Moss to SharePoint 2017 or something like that to in the cloud. Um, and there's probably another couple steps I missed in the middle of all that. But so I cut my teeth on it. So it's really my go-to. I love it and hate it at the same time because I've actually deleted myself as an owner of my own SharePoint site before and had to go to a system administrator to have my power restored um, because they made it, it's easy and hard to use at the same time. Um, so I, I started, um, I've built out a couple of different knowledge bases, but uh, now that we're in the cloud, I started looking for like, what kind of tools would go with a document library in SharePoint and yet also render search results in more of a Amazon, not product setting, but like where you've got the multifaceted um, filters. And so we just did. We um, put all of our content in, um, knowledge into a knowledge library, document library in SharePoint, um, codified all of that through um, uh, a savvy search engine and indexed all of those fields. And it basically is as good as a public library, you know, or better, depending on how you look at it or your university library. Um, it's for digital assets, not physical. Like we don't, people come and borrow stuff from my bookshelf. Maybe Bob, people do that with yours too. I don't know. Um, but for the most part, it is internal. I like SharePoint because I don't think Microsoft's going away. I really don't, but it's very expensive. If you're inside of an organization that's super small or you're an entrepreneur, it's not going to be, the, it's, it's not easy for you to cover the costs of that. And honestly, if the smaller the organization, you're going to find a different file management system, a different way to codify your internal knowledge. Um, you talk about Confluence, SharePoint, those are applications, right? So that knowledge that gets codified, stored, and shared in those applications is just part of what knowledge management includes. There's other things that are, you know, discovered in the process of 
walking together, working together uh, that may be stored elsewhere. But that's my go-to because it's, it's widely adopted by our clients as well as our company. Okay. I'd like to submit that for smaller companies, you might try OneNote and using it as a group OneNote. Mm-hmm. OneNote allows you to do a search for a single word and it will search through all the different pages. Mm-hmm. There's a way to index it that's logical of hierarchy. And the search engine's good. It really is in OneNote. It is. It is. Does anyone have any other questions? We've got Tammy for five more whole minutes. Um, one question. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Tammy. You're like literally a, like like a brain or something. <laughs> <laughs> you're a brain. Uh, I can tell. Uh, no, I mean literally like you're like 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 walking Google. Um, uh, like how do you like what would you suggest in terms of in terms of uh, uh in terms of user experience UI UX. Uh, giving users and users what they want. Um, what type of research do you? What type of research do you suggest, or, um, or do you say is is good to 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 satisfy end users to make sure that uh, to make sure that that uh, uh, end users are happy with the technology that they're using, um, and and it provides for what uh, what the requirements are. So. Um, like, you know, any, any type of, any suggestions that. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, collecting user stories, what jobs do you need to get done inside of your enterprise? Um, what of those are rooted in critical knowledge, um, that other people might have that you need to access, um, the, um, the, the, getting the, like, if you're doing requirements gathering that stakeholder, those stakeholder interviews are critical. I mean, I call, I call it research. I, yeah, I'm doing an in-depth interview. Like you can do that. You, every every good discipline in business does that, whether it's um, project management, change management, knowledge management, BA work. Um, but uh, there, the user experience is in the eye of the beholder. So whoever your key stakeholders are, that's who your end users are that you need to understand. What do they expect? And then how do you design to their expectations? Having them be a part of it is really important. Um, we have a change management practice at 1898 and co. So we have a lot of um, certified change practitioners. I'm one of them, um, but I don't do as much change management as some of my counterparts. Um, but it's, it's understanding the user needs. You can look at, you can benchmark what other fantastic tools do offer um, and test those. There's a lot of experimenting and prototyping that you can do when you're doing user design. Um, but I am not your user design expert. I know Thea is looking for a user design expert to speak on a future um, meeting, but I am. I design internal solutions and I'm a citizen developer and I trained developer. So I've been doing it a long time, but. And um, as a developer, do you. Uh, um, like what language do you develop in Java? Nope. Uh, Citizen developer works with whatever, whatever tool set is handily available. That's what they work with. So uh, for me, so I, when you were asking about different, um, oh, critical knowledge and which applications to use. The other thing Thea had asked about was, you know, which applications to use. If you're doing knowledge management inside of an organization, you use what the organization's norm is because you want to meet people where they are. You want to go where your people are. And if they're, if you're going to try to force them into a system, they're not going to intercept them in their opportune time of learning. You know, it's just, it's, it's irrelevant. It's irrational to think that you're going to move people off of a platform that they're on, on on a daily basis. So you work within that platform. Right. One, one more thing I wanted to mention before we run out of time is whenever you're working with people, especially a diverse group of people, if you have any kind of standard, you need to uh, promote that standard. For instance, if you have, let's say uh, you want to document all the projects in the company, create a template so everyone has the same, they're looking at it in the same order. They don't have to try to translate every document on its own, that it that they understand what they're looking at just because they're familiar with that template uh, and have the opportunity to make improvements to the template periodically, but start with something because mm-hmm. everybody's brain's going to process and present differently. If you have a template that everyone 
expects they, they're more likely to engage, they're more likely to complete it, and they're more likely to reference it. Yes, Bob? There is no one perfect answer for every situation. It always has to be adapted to the needs of the participants and stakeholders. Yep. That's why having a retrospective or a, a periodic review to see what can be improved is important. Yeah. Yes, Michael. Plan Where's that? It's slide four that's got that continuously growing organizational knowledge. It's very cyclical, yes. And identifying the problem up front correctly um, and then iterating with your client, you know, make sure, are we on the same page? Are we using the same nomenclature? Do we get each other? Are we missing in the middle? But right. yeah, continuous cycle. Tammy, tell us who you got your change management certification through. I'm interested. I got, it's ProSci. Um, so ADCAR is not an unfamiliar term for a lot of people. ADCAR is um, the model that they, I mean, it's not a model that ProSci uses. I mean, it's not a ProSci, it's not a ProSci um, copyrighted model, um, but they definitely use it. And so you can see, like, you can just go to Google, um, Google Images and do ADCAR and you'll see all of these descriptions. But um, yep, ProSci certification is available for people if they really want that. Okay, very good. Okay, we are at time and out of respect for your time, I try to stop on time. Okay, if you have any thanks. questions, please do contact me through LinkedIn and I will disseminate the questions to the correct people. If anyone's looking for a position or have positions to fill, again, contact me. Uh, my, I just found out my contract is ending, so I'm going to be looking for a position very shortly. So, uh, But my hobby is to help other people find positions to improve mm -hmm. their lives and, and to get you where you need to be. So I will see y'all next week. I don't quite know what we're going to do next week. I'm hoping to have a project manager here and that's my goal, but we're going to finish our, our professional series. We might have one or two weeks on agile and retrospectives and things like that to be sure people are aware of the agile. And then we will go back into our study questions starting with the introduction in chapter one. So I will see y'all next week. See you later, bye. Thank you, Tammy. Yep, thank you all.